Hello and welcome to this episode of Mind the Gap, making education work across the globe with me, Tom Sherrington and Emma Turner. Hello, Emma. Hi, Tom. You all right? Yeah, very good. I'm very excited about this. We're, we're talking to the one and only drum roll, Peps McRae. Hi, Peps. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, folks. Pleasure to be here and to be chatting with you. I, I have to say that we all united through the future edition of Walkthroughs, Volume 3. And Emma has written an, a fantastic uh, section on writing, like how, what is writing? It's really like a punchy boom. It's really, I think it's fantastic, really crisp summary. And you've written this amazing walkthrough about motivated teaching. And I think you did it, and it was like, it's already the shortest book ever, and you made the shortest summary of the shortest <laughs> So you, you have this sort of, you're sort of famous for wasting no words. And is that something you're happy with? Is that something you, you cultivated? <laughs> Firstly, like, A, thank you for a uh, you know, nice introduction. <laughs> B, thank you for uh, you know, asking me to you know, contribute to the, uh, the walkthroughs, but, you know, very privileged to do so. Uh, however, when you did ask, when you asked, I, I remember thinking, my goodness, I've spent years trying to like, you know, condense condense it down to this, just like one book. And you're asking me to do it in one page. <laughs> and so, but it was a great challenge, you know, really good to force me to think about, you know, how can you just distill this even further? Um, and yeah, like the whole like concise, ultra concise thing, I think is uh, like a, a probably a, more of an accident than a design. Uh, you know, I'm an engineer and then later mass teacher by trade. And I, you know, never really saw myself as being any good at writing. Um, and so my strategy, my kind of coping strategy was just to write as few words as possible and make sure they were as clear as possible. And, uh, you know, it seems to have worked out okay um, for the kinds of topics that, you know, I'm trying to communicate. Yeah, I think Dylan Williams says something about one of your books about literally, you know, not no word is wasted. And, and it, is, it is a bit of a knot. I, I was going to flash it up on the screen now because I, I, I was saying earlier that I have a copy of motiva Motivated Teaching, but as, as happens to many good books that are, we only have one copy of in my house, they go to my wife's school <laughs> when she thinks they're really going to be useful. <laughs> so, and unfortunately, that's gone before I managed to buy a second one. So the only copy in the house no longer is in the house which is a great sign, but I do have a copy on my phone of your walkthrough, so I'll just <laughs> scroll up here. So I'm literally going to be referring to it uh, by the photos of it on my phone. It is, Whereas it is... I, Tom, have been a very good student and have, and have three of... <laughs> on well, my shelf that, and in my hand. Wonderful teaching. Full now, suite. <laughs> Emma, Emma, you've got this full suite, so congratulations. That's great. Like, bingo there. <laughs> do I have oh. to shout like bingo or something? <laughs> <laughs> but Tom, you've got one of the like a, a old school covers, you know. So yeah, that's uh, you know, there's there's a bit of bit of a that's a rare one, you know. In the future, it'll be worth so much more. <laughs> um, but the interesting thing is that the, the what that kind of tells you it is, is a little bit about like the other side of my writing, which is that it's self-published. So I kind of you know publish myself, and I've always done so because it allows me to have like full control over both the content and the, the cover. And so like what you've seen there is a little bit of the journey that I've taken in terms of my own cover design. Back in the day, they were pretty shocking. Uh, they're not great now, but they're definitely better than they were. Well, that's quite impressive. That's, I, I'm, I'm very impressed to hear that. So I, I, I first, uh, I saw, I've seen you speak a few times and, and one time I saw you at the Wellington Festival and it was all very, you know, it was like shoes and socks off, down you know if you have this whole kind of funky style and I just thought is that is that like you feel like you kind of need to be grounded or something to feel like you're connecting with the with the audience is yeah, that is I, that like I, I'm, not, I'm not sure have you ever tried have you ever tried like teaching I used to when I used to teach we no. had like the school first school I worked in had carpets in the classrooms you know great design great design decision because it like supports with the acoustics and um, but also like really nice from a from a teacher perspective because you could know, kick off your shoes and just feel like so it always just feels a bit nicer when you can connect with the ground, I think. And I don't think there's anything, nothing more spiritual than that, really. Just a, like a nice feeling. Um, 
And yes, yeah, just something I've kind of always done when I've been at the front of a classroom. And so therefore, when I find myself like in a kind of conference setting, it, uh, there's like a whole bunch of cues perhaps in there that make me feel a little bit more relaxed, a bit more at ease, you know, like I was back in the classroom. I suspect when you do it, it's like, hey, look, there's the Pepsi, so cool. With no, if, if I did it, people are going, why, why has Tom just not put his shoes on? <laughs> The first time I saw you, Pets, I was and it just so happened to have the pen there. I saw you at research in London, and I could, I was just completely taken aback with us. Yeah, where's his shoes? <laughs> What's going on? Why has the man got no shoes on? But it was absolutely brilliant because I don't know whether it was intentional or whether it was part of your kind of um, what you do, but it was incredibly memorable and I couldn't stop listening to you because I was immediately hooked on what you were going to say because I'm thinking I've never seen anybody present with that many shoes on this man must be a genius or crazy I need to this is great this is a great this is great feedback you know this is what I need to know for my you know the future presentations <laughs> keep the, the email, yeah. what it went well last... shoes off yeah we do we do that's have people questions today. We do, we, do have, we do have deeper questions, but uh, you know, we, we, it's like this is like a softball opener. I, I, it, it's better, like the other. Just relatedly, like, it, that's a bit better than often the other bit of feedback I get, which is around the tattoos. So I do like you know, I go and do sessions around memorable teaching or around you know how to reduce the number of distractions that people face, and then folks come up to me afterwards and say, "Oh, Peps, tell me about the tattoos. You know, why have you got your shoes off?" And it's like, "Oh, I've just been trying to like preach about distractions." and then it loads in uh, such hypocrisy yeah. all, all, all my tattoos are hidden so they never get no one, people don't even know I have them until I mention it but yeah maybe I should like uh, look. Yeah, yeah. come on Tom show us let's have a look come on I'll show you I'll show you one should I look yeah yeah, yeah let's have a look live on air look here we go yeah. first showing prime viewing Tom's tattoo this is you've seen it here first yeah, Tom's getting his guns there. out Emma, you're going to be next. Tom, Tom's sharing with his guns. <laughs> oh, wow. This is, these oh, are the, my goodness. This is a standard model for, of, of particle physics. It's tattooed on my arm. No way. Serious? And a whole bunch of other symbols there, yeah. you got the standard That's model. That's true. <laughs> that is, whoa, super geek. That's awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You might as well have the meaning of life tattooed on your arm. That's yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're gonna have something, Emma. What about you? I have neither the signature dance move, which is the other thing you talk about, Pep. <laughs> I also have my shoes on, and I have no tattoos. I am feeling so vanilla right now. <laughs> no tattoos yet. This is like this week. <laughs> this week. This week. Yeah. <laughs> it's never but too late. I, to start. I went through a period about three years ago where I felt like it's an existentially mortal, and I was thinking, who cares? I mean. Your body's your body, and then you die. And then, why, why would why does it matter if you have any tattoos on it or not? Right. You get to but a certain now, age where you're like, you know, I can't regret it for that much longer. Yeah, exactly. Like, who's going to notice? I mean, barely yes. anyone. So it's, it's <laughs> anyway. Look, I want to ask you. I want to ask you about about you because I, I you, you you're someone who am I right in thinking that you were sort of you you started teaching, but then you went into teacher training quite quickly. Uh, and and what was why was that so interesting to you sort of you must have got a feel for the classroom and you're someone who's been a professional teacher uh, educator for longer than most people I know, I know who still is in the world and of it and doing it so what was your what was why did that sort of grab you and what you know what what led you that way yeah uh, so you know the, the the story I tell myself anyway you know who knows what what the, the reality is but the, the kind of story woven for myself is that um, so my mum's a, a teacher, uh, been a mass teacher like myself, uh, and my sister and my wife, um, and five of her sisters. So there's a lot of like uh, you know mass teaching, just teaching in the family. Um, and when I was growing, like when she went to school, she went to the same school I went to, and she got to sixth form. And I think her head of math said, "Wendy." go away, do your teacher, teacher training and come straight back. And so she, she spent, you know, the, the guts of her life in pretty much this, the same corridor, maybe even the same classroom. Um, and actually, whenever I went to primary school and, and uh, you know, partly part of part of my time at secondary school, um, I, you know, after after primary school was over, which ended before secondary school, I would just come and sit in the back of her classroom. So since like the age of, I don't know, four or so, 
I've been sitting in the back of mass classrooms or sitting somewhere in mass classrooms. So it was like age of four to like seven in the back of mum's classroom, trying to answer the questions that all the kids were, were you know, being asked and just generally absorbing that, that experience. And then secondary school got to sit in that classroom myself. And then, um, you know, went and trained to be a teacher and, you know, was a math teacher myself. So, you know, really experienced it from that angle. And then it kind of just, it felt like, you know, I, I taught in the classroom for about seven years or so. Um, and just always loved this, the kind of idea of helping other people to like understand what was going on in their classroom and how to, to do it better, trying to figure that out. Um, and so I'd find myself sitting in the back of classrooms again, even when I was, you know, working in schools, because I was just so fascinated by watching the, the act and trying to deconstruct it and figure out what's going on and, you know, how can we make it better? Um, and I suppose over time, any opportunity that came up to like mentor another teacher or to support with, you know, the, the design of PD in the school or to help out the local university at Brighton, you know, I would be there, hand up first in line, you know, I'll help, I'll help, I'll help, but just because I was so fascinated and so interested in the kind of the mechanics of, of teaching and learning. And so, you know, whenever a, a, a role came up there, yeah, about seven years into my career to run the PGC maths course at Brighton, um, yeah, I was... I was kind of I went for it. I thought, you know, this is a really interesting next step for me. Of course, uh, you know, meant stepping out of the classroom and leaving all of the great stuff behind that was happening there. Um, but for me, that trade-off was, was worth it at that time and kind of has been ever since. Um, I find, you know, helping other people to get better at teaching just as, as satisfying as, as helping kids in the classroom. Well, I agree with that. And Emma, you do the same, don't you? And that's, that's we, we all have that in common, don't we? Yeah, it's... it's... And I think if you, I don't know if it's the same for you, Pep, but I always want to make sure that children have got really great teachers in front of them. And if you're in the classroom, your reach is 30 kids. And if you help other people, then that reach is much broader. So it's just such a privilege, like you say, to kind of watch and watch other people develop and to help them develop. It's just an absolute joy, an absolute joy. And I reference your books all the time with the teachers that I work with. <laughs> Does that, form, the plug. <laughs> does that form part of the, your of your thought process? I mean, like you when I don't know it's exactly when you started doing teacher training, but it, it's, this is a debate we've had with a few people on our program about, um, like with Sam Twisterton and this whole debate around the content of a PGCE versus other routes into training and how, whether there's enough cognitive science in them or whether universities should be free to set their own curriculum and all that. I mean. Without, you know, because obviously everyone has professional responsibilities. I don't want to put you into a tight position, I think. But do you feel like, do you have a view of that? Do you think universities should be kind of expansive setting the agenda? Or do you feel like this need to have a kind of a core curriculum around specific ideas is, is really needed? Okay, so yeah, good, good, good question. Um, there's probably like multiple answers to that question, if that makes sense. I think, um, firstly, not just uni universities, but a wide range of stakeholders should be contributing towards what we th think uh, teaching is, and like what, what in particular what like good teaching might look like, or what teachers might need to know to achieve it, or be able to do to achieve it. So I think it's a really important conversation to bring as many people into as possible, um, because it's just too complex for <laughs> any kind of one. Uh, group to be able to to tackle um you know we need universities to be like you know contributing to the, you know people within universities to be contributing to that but also equally there are you know many smart people not working in universities in you know schools in teaching school hubs as pd trainers and other you know, pd provider organizations uh, other policy organizations loads and loads of different people who you know, have good things to contribute to that conversation so that's the first thing is like you know i think it's it's a, a professional responsibility for us all to figure out what how to how to help how, what good teaching means and how to improve it um but on the, on the flip side there is i think there is something of value in having a degree of uh coherence or alignment um it's a bit like i suppose it's a bit like uh, I often like to try and compare or think about the uh, similarities between medicine and education. 
And actually, you know, for the first few years of, uh, you know, medical training, what you really want is to ensure that uh, as many teacher, as many doctors as possible or physicians get exposed to like what, what that um, sector as a whole thinks are the best ideas and for there to be a degree of consistency across training around the country because otherwise you end up with people being trained in one thing in place A and then moving to place B and not being able to build like uh, coherently on the prior knowledge that they had at the other place and so I, I do believe that uh, a degree of consistency is a positive thing uh, like a in, in netwise across the sector um, but then of course the trade-off that you get there is that you lose a little bit of the uh, like ability to, to tailor knowledge to to local context because of consistency I suppose it's a bit like you know school contexts um, you know every teacher uh, you know would like to have their own way of you know, managing their classroom but we know that when all teachers pull together and manage classrooms in the same way you get uh, this kind of multiplier effect which means that pupils just you know the culture is stronger within a school and so it's this trade-off between the kind of individual and the collective uh, and finding that sweet spot in the middle I think is just an important thing for us always to be trying to pursue. Yeah the sweet spot we are I, I, that's interesting. <laughs> what Michael Childs Michael Childs has got a book on the <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so in, 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 I mean, I, I saw a, a, this the, as a recent debate has just sprung up, and I'm just showing these questions randomly really, because I was just so interested in like this, the, the dynamics of our community that a debate just sprung up recently in America, in California, about the the maths curriculum, and it's like, uh, and Joe Bowler is one of the famous figures associated with that, and there, there are schools of thought about maths education and debates and angry voices so when you're in a teacher training scenario what do you have to take a view of that or do you have to take an institutional view and how much when you were doing that did you, do you have a lot of degrees of freedom to be yourself and say this is kind of what i think it, well it um it, i suppose it it depends on which role i'm or what role i've been in you know if you were uh, if you ask me that question about the level of autonomy I had when I worked in, at, you know, at university, uh, then, you know, I had a, a greater degree of freedom because I was working directly with a, a small group and had like almost complete control over, over the, the, like the, certainly the, the, the subject specific part of that curriculum. Um, uh, in my work at Ambition, the, our, uh, programs reach a much much greater audience and so there we have to make sure that it, the content of those programs is, is as applicable as possible to as many different people as possible um and so i suppose like what, what was the answer to the question yes you do have to take a view i suppose um equally you need to make sure that you are trying to expose teachers or whatever stage of their career they're in to the different debates within the sector as well um, and help them to try and understand like the different sides of the argument and the different strengths of evidence um, that's really hard you know that like the the Joe Bowler's like uh, situation is a really tricky one to try and like wrap your head around there are really strong like you say really strong narratives coming from both sides um, and it's not like I, I don't I'd be very surprised if there was a really clear black and white answer about, you know, who's right in any of those debates. Um, but just trying to help people, trying to weigh up the evidence and give them the kind of research literacy, for want of a better word, to be able to make good decisions about their professional practice. I think it's a really important part of teacher education. Um, yeah. I've just mulled over, Peps, because I don't know, and Tom probably rolled his eyes a bit on. <laughs> But I'm just thinking about kind of transferability and this, uh, this idea of this broad general base that we're talking about, about everybody having to, that general overview. And I just want to pick your brains about where do you think the point comes at which you have to be more kind of phase specific? So what are the kind of general transferable elements that you think for all teachers, regardless of phase or stage, that, that they all need to know? The bit, which are the bits do you think are 
truly phase specific and not necessarily transferable because there's there's lots of discussion within training and teacher development which a lot of the time sort of primary or early years thinks well that's all very well and good but that doesn't translate into teaching very young children so I'm trying to kind of unpick your thinking about what are the general elements and what are the bits that are different in your view and your experience yeah yeah so yeah really interesting question Emma um and yeah one I've been trying to figure out for quite a while um and currently doing a PhD at UCL um with uh, Mark Hardman and Ginny Golding supervisors shout out to them thank you guys um uh, and trying to like tackle th this very question as part of it and where I've kind of got to is that there are every teacher regardless of phase and subject um, is trying to tackle a common set of problems but the solutions to those problems look different depending on your subject and context so that's <laughs> so let me try and explain what i mean here so every teacher regardless of whether you're early years or you know secondary maths teacher is trying to um figure out what they want their pupils to to learn so they're trying to figure out the curriculum piece they're trying to trying to conduct assessment they're trying to understand what their pupils know uh, based on that curriculum they're trying to figure out how they help their pupils get from a to b from where they are now to what they want them to learn and they're trying to motivate them to a certain extent to invest their you know attention and effort in in that journey as well as trying to figure out how to regulate themselves to do all of those things in the moment so those for me are like the you know five per, what mary kenny mary kennedy might call persistent problems of teaching there are things that every teacher faces regardless of the, the context that they operate in. However, the answer to those questions will vary quite a lot depending on the context you're in. In fact, the answer to those questions is probably unique for every single teacher. <laughs> and it probably varies for the different classes you face and the different days you teach and the different, you know, like phases of the year and all kinds of things. So, you know, an early years teacher, the answer to the curriculum question would be very different to the secondary maths teacher. As a result, the answer to some of their assessment approaches might be quite different as well. However, the answer to the motivation question might actually uh, be different in some ways, but the same in other ways. And that kind of, de it's just, it's a bit of a, you know, glib answer, but it depends. <laughs> you know, some things are different uh, and, and other things aren't as different. We have some common cognitive architecture, which kind of um, is common across humans, regardless of what age they are. And yet we have different, completely different curricula that we teach depending on the, the, the kind of stage and subject we teach. And so those, the interaction between those kind of differences um, are what uh, like make the, 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 the training situation more or less specific. And so from a like professional development perspective, like it, 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 it's, we talked earlier about the need to kind of have some level of consistency um, to make sure that we're you know, giving teachers the best deal possible, as well as having like a degree of, uh, you know, tailoring to context. And I think this is how you, for me, this is how you reconcile those two things. You make sure you're like asking like all of these questions, you know, what does, um, like how do we figure out how to help teachers decide what to teach their the pupils? How do we help teachers to figure out how to assess them, how to motivate them? Uh, to instruct them and to, to regulate themselves but the answer to those questions will necessarily be a quite different um, and then what we need to, to use in the middle is basically all of like the, the the knowledge that we have based both from the literature and from our experience to try and weave an answer and the more you kind of go from like this side to this side more from the kind of like generic to the specific the more uh, input you will need from subject and phase specialists so for mm -hmm. example you know that's why mentoring is a really good tool for helping to like uh, contextualize some of those ideas we know that you know regardless of your teaching role you you've got to try and figure out how you assess well but actually uh, you know some of the principles of assessment will look very different in the secondary maths classroom to they do in uh, you know early years classroom I, I, I think that's the best answer anyone's ever given to a question on our program <laughs> I was just going to, I was going to follow it up with though. So is it possible, and this is not a leading question, I'm not trying to, trying to lead you, God, nothing. 
is it actually possible to create a generic program for teaching if the answers are so specific? Well, it depends what you mean by program. So, As in, a tra- like a, a, like a, a, a training, a training, a generic course or a generic program for training teachers at any stage. Is it is it actually possible? Do you think to well, be able to well, say this is meaningful, this is relevant, this is transferable, this is actionable, and it doesn't matter who walks through my door, whether it's foundation stage or post sixteen, these things I'm going to say will work for you all is that is that possible well so yeah i love it it's a great question right and it depends what you mean by program okay i'm gonna you know, come back to this again Emma, because if you're just conceptualizing a program as like a whole bunch of a body of content then yeah. then it would have to be enormously deep and responsive <laughs> okay so you know you have to be able to you probably couldn't do it in a book form you probably need some kind of digital architecture that allows you to go Right, you know, I learn about like assessment, the generic principles of assessment, and then I'm going to click into like secondary specific, and then I'm going to click into secondary math specific, or you take the tree that takes you down to early years and you filter it down so you have both some of like the, the generic big ideas that we know apply to all assessment situations, as well as the like really specific examples of like your, that are relevant to you in your classroom. However, for me, a program is more than just the content, it's also the kind of delivery vehicle, the delivery mechanism, as it were. And um, like you can have a program whereby you have you know a mentor like the early career framework, and what the mentor does is they act as a kind of like a tailoring device. So rather than having this digital like content tree that allows you to like you know responsibly find exactly the content for you, um, what the mentor does is they do a bit of that parsing uh, of, of that content. And so perhaps if you introduce some of like the general principles of you know, reliable and valid assessment, um, then what the mentor can do is because they have experience of like what those look like in the classroom can help, uh, you know, an early career teacher, for example, see what this looks like in their context. For both a secondary math teacher, you'd probably need a different mentor for early years because not many people have that dual specialism. Um, but yes, so, so the answer is, I think you can if you have the right pieces in place. Um, it's not enough just to have like a kind of a textbook curriculum, as it were. Yeah. needs to be a lot more sophisticated because of this kind of like because of the different needs of the generic and specific and the teachers need both i think yeah i mean i feel like what i found in my work in the last couple of years is, is how far you can go i mean i do a lot of training with say you know through schools or mat, mats or you've got primary early years and secondary to fe you know all, all sort of wrapped in a place and I find that there are a lot of concepts like you've just outlined some, but even some much more practical ones like questioning techniques and concepts of retrieval and and concepts to do with modelling. I was talking today about that and, you know, modelling in early years looks different to modelling in a physics class, but it's still an idea that showing, you know, how do children learn by being shown and what does that mean and how do you transfer and, you know, all, all sorts of, and it's almost like you're asking the question. I think it's important that you're not just saying this is what to do, but you're saying, how do you do this is, and how does it work? And so you, you get that. Do you think that, I mean, you've, the, the most recent book that you've, the, is, it, is it the most recent book? God, I don't know if it's a recent book, The Motivated Teaching. It book. is, Toby Oge, off the hook. <laughs> it's, it's so good. I mean, it, it's almost like, a, I mean, you could read it like a sort of self-help book, but it's also for adults, for teachers, for students. And it's so interesting like you've you've this this motivation for success. I mean, if I just rattle off that the, the, there are five bits that you've put in our walkthrough into this secure success, and I really want to ask you about that. There's um run routines, so things that are kind of normal, and, and then nudge norms, build belonging and boost buy-in. And all these things, I mean, that's there's there's a lot in, in each of A lot of those. alliteration in there. Yeah, good stuff, isn't it? <laughs> so, I mean, for me, there's such an interesting thing there, because there's a lot of you know other 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 stuff in the in the in our in our sector about say growth mindset and that kind of approach but when you, but this idea of secure success to me is so essential isn't it like students who are struggling at school are not it's like classic you know why don't students like school there it is it's often because they can't do it and it ain't fun so this thing of just built motivation through just engineering success is so important but that's true for teachers too isn't it 
if teaching feels like you're always chasing something and you can't do it, it's it's hard compared to when you're feeling, hey, this is good. I'm getting there, I'm getting there. So do you think these are generic things or are you thinking very schooly when you're talking about it in this book? So in, in this book, I've tried to like tailor it specifically to school, the school context. Um, mm. I think there are some aspects of like the framework that are applicable um, to other contexts, you know, so like social norms are, you know, just as powerful for book buying habits <laughs> as they are for, you know, learning habits. Uh, you know, we, they're just like the, the number of stars that you have on your book on Amazon, Tom, you know, is, is like super important, you know that. Um, and that's, you know, just as important in the classroom for a culture of like, you know, pupils feeling like comfortable asking questions in the class. However, um, like some of the stuff isn't like just doesn't quite translate from the literature. So, for example, there is like in the literature, there's some interesting stuff around, uh, you know, uh, reward and like like pleasure, like the role of pleasure in motivation. Um, but actually, it doesn't like that that kind of stuff just doesn't translate quite as easily into the classroom context because, like you say, learning uh, is by its very nature often quite effortful um, and so like some of the stuff you yeah that doesn't necessarily apply across all situations well i love this idea that you sort of lean to lean in towards like with the nudge norms into some things around i want to quite like the way you, you, it's quite sort of subtle language but you don't go hard in like we all must do x but at the same time you're sort of saying but um you know if there's an alignment about the way teachers are behaving and you've got norms which are more than readily enforced then it's easier for, stu for teachers to ex students to experience those as the norms so do you feel that you find yourself through that going towards more sort of strongly kind of regime orientated behavior systems <laughs> or, or or not i mean i i wasn't sure i mean if you get asked those questions about which you know again there's camps on this or, or are you are you a bit more nuanced around that yeah, um, well, I think like there's, there's definitely so you, you you have a bit. I think there's like a bit of a tension here that you kind of schools need to reconcile because you have definitely you know evidence to suggest that social norms are really are really powerful. Okay, the more people you have like doing a certain thing, the harder for you as it, the harder for you it is to like do something different. And, you know, this is not just true in school, but for all of us, you know, in the cinema, when everybody's sitting quietly, uh, it's really hard for you to stand up and sing, <laughs> you know, whatever it is, or when everybody's queuing up for, you know, the, the club or wherever you guys go these days, it's really hard for you to go and push in the front, you know, it's just like social norms have a, have a really big like influence on our, our behavior, often heavily un unconsciously. However, I think the, often like the, 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 the counter to that or the, opposing force is one of um, having a certain degree of autonomy or individual identity as well and so you know if you like go full down the like conformity route you kind of end up with quite a like a uh, maybe a like a military type <laughs> organization which um you know kind of doesn't allow any kind of like individual identity which i think can be counterproductive to motivation to a certain extent. And so I think like schools, the, the challenge for schools is to try and find that sweet spot again in between, like balancing those two tensions. Um, we know one hand there's like strong evidence to suggest that, you know, if you get a large group of people doing, uh, you know, a certain thing and that thing's desirable, such as like aspiring to go on to college or to learn more, then great, the more you can encourage that, the more people you can have doing that, the more likely that you know, you will help those pupils who, you know, are, are struggling to like, you know, develop that aspiration. Whereas at the same time, uh, you know, there are, we are, people are unique and will have different aspirations. And so allowing those individual identities to also find a place, find some kind of identity will also, uh, you know, allow them to like be more motivated as well, because they feel it's like they, they, there's a certain, they belong as an individual and not just, aren't just part of like a, you know, a, a mass group. Uh, yeah, God, it's, it's so interesting, isn't it? Like, I, I mean, I, I've, I've seen that, um, well, I remember as the head of a grammar school and so some students, like tiny rebellions, you know, like the little badge. It's like, 
Like, it's like a tiny thing, like their little breakaway was like, you could see it, it like, it's funny, like you have the uniformity and you sort of almost are, the guilt, are responsible for enforcing it, but then you're kind of pleased to see when people are kind of pushing against it. I, that's a challenge, it's a dilemma. Emma, what's, what's your fair sense of that? Um, yeah, I, I was just thinking, whilst you're talking that, I was just thinking about um, how accessible you make everything that you say and how applicable to all those settings. And the everything that you say and everything that you write, I, I always find myself sort of nodding along. And I said, I described your take on things this morning. I was talking to a colleague and I went, it's just so crisp what he says it's just it's absolutely beautifully crisp because I think you do what I was alluding to earlier is that you manage to take any aspect of teaching whether that's norms whether that's lesson planning whether that's motivation whether that's anything and you make it so um crisp that anybody in any phase at any stage can access it and I I, I cannot say enough how much I use your work with staff at all stages with staff in all phases because I think you explain everything from the norms thing to the lesson planning thing to the motivation thing just so beautifully and so accessibly that it just makes so much sense <laughs> massive amounts of sense so I just wanted to say thank you perhaps because uh, you saved me a massive amount of time in what I do but in terms of rebellion when we're not particularly rebellious at primary Tom with the <laughs> Are you? It's full of mavericks from what I see. I mean, I think... <laughs> well, yeah, I, think <laughs> I think our rebellion in primary is just our day-to-day, to be perfectly honest. Exactly. I think it can, I, I feel like it's, it's, it's hard enough just... That whole thing of, like, herding cats on the carpet and stuff. Oh, it is. It is. It's, I, I mean, perhaps I, I'm interested in this. I mean, you have this fantastic job title, like, the, you're called a dean. And I, I just think that's, like, one of my life goals. So, I mean, how do you... What is that? What is and, and so you know we don't have mean? <laughs> you're dean of of program design, and it's sort of is this so you know it's just have you got like a, like some exciting projects that you're working on? This whole teacher training space is quite dynamic at the moment, isn't it? And programs, national programs, and do you, do you feel that's an exciting time for us? Yeah, hugely. I really do. Uh, like really excited by the the kind of level of investment. That has been put, in, put into professional development across the board. Uh, the level of the conversation is just like head and shoulders above really anything I've come across before. I talked to, you know, a chapter folks like Doug Lamov or, or Ben Riley over in the US or, you know, chatting to some people in Australia. And I talked to them about the kind of the, the degree of thought and, you know, degree of appetite for improving things over here. And they just, their minds are blown. They really are. So I think, you know, I'm really, really grateful for the situation that we're in in the UK. And of course, uh, you know, there are, um, I know there are areas that could be improved and we can, you know, always do better. But I do think we're at a point which is you know, really, really exciting. And um, over time, as long as we continue to iterate, continue to keep an open mind and be open to, you know, critique and improvement, that we're just going to keep, like, you know, going from strength to strength. And if we can get to a point where we're, you know, we've got a really robust and uh, reliable system for helping teachers to get better, you know, not only at the start of their career, but throughout. I think, I really do think, uh, you know, not only will that have a, you know, a really profound impact on pupils in the classroom, but also on things like retention of teachers and the status of the profession as a whole and the feeling that teachers have about like how professional they are. Like when you, you know, you talk to doctors, one of the reasons that they uh, have like, such a high status and they feel like such a professional is because they just know a lot and have a huge amount of confidence in the knowledge that they do have and so you know hopefully I think like we are taking steps in in that direction um, and yeah really love to be able to like live for another hundred years to see like what this space is going to be like uh, then uh, maybe yeah I, who knows can I just ask Pep you know this session that you did at Research Head London which oh, yeah. one <laughs> The, the, it was the last session of it was the last session of the afternoon and you were talking about the snail it had about right. yeah I just found that completely fascinating and I just wondered because it it links to your next book or your next piece of writing doesn't it so I just wondered if you wanted to give us a bit of a flavor of that or a bit of an overview of that because I wrote copious notes during that session <laughs> yeah, <true. laughs> it was absolutely brilliant <laughs> 
Sure. So, so you know, this next book's around developing teacher expertise, um, and it's really all about trying to like figure out what are the what are the kind of frameworks that we might use to help us reliably develop teacher expertise. And I think we've already talked about one of the frameworks in the book, this this like idea of the five persistent problems of teaching, um, and how that kind of like translates to a more specific context as well. Um, we haven't the other like framework that sits alongside it that we haven't talked about is our is kind of like the the pedagogical uh, arc that you need to take with teachers to help them learn that stuff. That makes sense. And so this, you know, the snail, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll set, this, set aside the snail for the minute, but essentially there's like, a, I think there are a degree of, or, or are a number of professional development activities that we probably want to take all teachers through to get them to a point of like, uh, like learning something in a meaningful and lasting way. Um, and the, I think like, try and remember what the, the different things are. The, the first one I think is like, get it. So get it is about like helping them to understand the mechanics of that aspect of teaching and learning. So earlier on, we talked a little bit about, about assessment. So that might be helping them understand like what does reliability you know, validity or you know, perhaps even a, like you know, uh, alternative concept mean in assessment? Like what is the, what is the big idea there? Um, uh, and then the next after get it is see it. So like, what does that look like? Uh, ideally in a classroom as close to a classroom as mine. So it's really like, I think it's really important that we provide teachers with really rich models that like are highly relevant to them um, alongside that kind of like slightly more theoretical knowledge. And because those two, you know, we need both sides of those coin for teachers to be able to be, um, you know, adaptive in the classroom. Adaptive expertise requires both like uh, quite like highly fluent bank of uh, strategies as well as like strong understanding of how and why those strategies work so that you can adapt them for different contexts and use them at the right time and place um, but as well as like just seeing it uh, and getting it that those things aren't enough because uh, we need to make sure that we kind of close that knowing doing gap as it were so we, all too often professional development used to just be about like you know, helping teachers to you know, showing teachers some stuff and telling them some stuff and assuming that was enough but we know now that that doesn't lead to like lasting changes in behavior so um you know uh, use it is a really important uh, kind of principle as well helping teachers to actually practice using those things um ideally to begin with in a uh, lower stakes context so you know not necessarily trying it out in the classroom as the first port of call but perhaps trying it in a slightly lower stakes environment uh, you know with another member of staff who can give you feedback to see whether you're getting it right or just even on your own in front of a mirror to run through uh, things a, f a few times without having the cognitive load of being able to manage all of the things that are going on in the classroom as well as trying to change your, your practice. Um, and then the kind of final piece there is, is around uh, keeping it um, because we can like get to a point where we're able to do something but actually if that doesn't become uh, part of the habit of our practice as a teacher then you know that professional development was, was kind of wasted and so there are I think some things we can do from the professional development perspective to lock in those those habits uh, you know we can think about implementation intentions we can think about you know kind of spaced retrieval from a like a pd perspective um there are a variety of things we can do and then so those four things the get it the see it the use it and the keep it are also wrapped up in a kind of like uh, own it piece which we you know have touched on a couple of times around motivation like motivation is as important for teachers as it is for pupils we know you know when teachers are like are bought in to the thing that they're learning there's a much greater chance that they'll end up um apologies uh, much greater chance that they'll end up you know putting that into practice so there you go there's the snail if you can imagine there those things go. in the shape of a snail <laughs> i was just doing that to wind tom bennett up Oh, Tom, you're on mute. Tom, you... I'm amateur hour. It's because there's a washing machine going. It's a real life around here. So <laughs> um, it's, it's a power of fives. It's, I mean, everything should be in fives. Um, and <laughs> But it's, it's great. And also it sounds like a kind of a 70s disco song, which is also really good. You know, <laughs> Get it. See it. <laughs> Use it. Keep it. <laughs> oh, is, that the, is that the signature dance move, Pex, that you mentioned? I'll tell you what. I, you need is to come in. 
Someone needs to write a tune. And really, honestly, it's great talking to you. Honestly, I feel like we're just getting warmed up here, but we need to finish now. But it's honestly, that was fa- it's fantastic. I'm really looking forward to that. I think it sounds fantastic. And, I, and I'm going to say again, we are super thrilled that you are in Walks Through the Street, both of you. And the, the motivation stuff is just, I feel like people are just sort of just getting into it. And uh, there's so much material there. So if you're not read it yet, folks, get, get stuck into it. Uh, motivated teaching and the full suite. And... Pep's McRae, a short book coming to you soon about the, 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 the disco do it. And is there a name for that model? I mean, is it what's it going to be called? The, the escargot. The escargot. You were going to say that. <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, honestly, we have to stop now. And uh, we, it's so great to talk to you. Oh, it's so, it really is fantastic. And I love it. I love what you're doing. It's so good to hear you uh, explain all these brilliant ideas in person. And I'm sure people will really enjoy this episode. Um, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure and, you know, hope to catch up to you before long. Thank you so much. Thanks, both. Thanks, Lovely chatting. See you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everybody. OK, so that's the end of this episode. Thanks for joining us once again on Mind the Gap, making education work across the globe with me and Emma. Uh, have a, you know, hope everyone's having a good break by the time you have listened to this. You may have had a good break. But, you know, thank you so much to Peps and uh, we'll see you on another episode coming soon. Thanks, everybody.